All right, guys. I think we're taking enough time for a break. Uh, so, Russell, if you'll, uh, as the program chair, introduce the next program. Okay. <laughs> uh, before I before I get going, uh, I I would like to uh, thank everybody uh, in the last few weeks for their their good wishes and everything. For those of you that didn't hear that I'm one of the lucky ones that uh, even after having both of my shots back in March, I still got it. So, uh, but uh, I've been negative for a couple of weeks, so we're, we're good. So uh, thank you for everybody that sent emails and cards and so on. I, I really appreciate that. It was really kind of a non-event, just like having the winter type flu for a couple of days. So. There you have it. Anyways, on to signals. I, I think that all of us uh, will agree that uh, uh, whether it's uh, on the one-to-one uh, -one scale or somebody else's layout that uh, if we see signals out there when we're rail fanning or uh, on, on somebody's layout, uh, uh, a couple of us, I uh, have been to uh, Tom Kane's layout uh, up in the Indy uh, area to operate his uh, Santa Fe Railroad. And um, uh, he has operating signals and it's really, really fun to, uh, when you're driving a train to, to actually uh, watch the signals and do what they tell you to do. So, um, so they certainly add an awful lot of interest. And if we can get them to operate as close to uh, prototype uh, that the uh, railroad that we're modeling, all the better. So uh, up on the screen now is uh, the, uh, the old uh, New York Central Main Line uh, just uh, east of Buffalo, which is one of the spots on uh, my layout. And um, uh, this is a really neat shot because uh, on the two uh, tracks here uh, that we're facing, we have uh, the inner line or absolutes uh, as they're called. And over on the two on the right, we have blocks or permissives. And uh, we'll find out later on that the uh, interlockings as we normally uh, refer to them as that um, uh, they're, they're absolute because if you get a red uh, like up there now that you will stop, whereas on the blocks or permissives in some places, uh, you can go ahead and proceed past the red. And one of them, uh, I'm getting all this information from of course, uh, my in-house, uh, uh, advisor Steve Lasher. So what a, a better person to, to know that the guy who drove the train and knew all these signals. But uh, one uh, particular case that you could go ahead and pass a red on a block would if it had a G plate uh, and the G would stand for grade and you're climbing a grade and they didn't want the train to stop and and possibly not get going again on that grade so so with um today's uh technology uh the uh, electronics and in the nano leds that we can now uh, replicate the railroads uh signaling and uh here we are right uh, uh right behind us <clears throat> right behind me sorry uh, on, on the railroad that, that we've been able to do uh, just such. So let's maybe jump back uh, 70 years to where uh, if we had Lionel or American Flyer, maybe even Marks that uh, most of them had some type of signal, whether it was a block signal or signal bridge like this Lionel. And this worked pretty well pretty nice. The, 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 the one head, oh boy, I keep doing that, Fred. Uh, you, maybe you're right. I'll use the mouse. Uh, the one head right here, or either one of them that you could turn around the opposite direction, that if you had a uh, different direction, uh, opposite direction uh, traveling on your track, 
that worked pretty nice. And the one thing that throughout all this that we want to do is one, we want to be able to detect where the train is. So the signal can go to uh, green to red or maybe yellow. And then we have to have some device that's going to activate or animate the signals. So Lionel had uh, a pretty simple and uh, easy to use uh, pressure plate here. So uh, the track laid across the plate here and over here was an adjustment spring. And so what you would do is uh, adjust it so the weight of your train would uh, press down on the uh, pressure plate there and the signal would go from green to red. The problem with this is uh, as years went on and uh, Lionel started to do away with a lot of the metal and started to have more plastic, you might have a lighter car in the middle of your train and when it went across the plate, uh, the, the tension wasn't the same. So the signal would go back to green when your train was uh, right in the middle of the block there. Um, so it, it worked, but not that, not that great. And it was okay because more than likely we had it on a four by eight sheet of something. And in a matter of seconds, the train was going to come back around again, so it was okay. So let's jump back to the 21st century. And now we have two popular ways of doing train detection. Uh, one of them is a CT coil, like you see here. This happens to be the RR circuits uh, one. And... Um, there's, there's other, NCE makes one, uh, uh, Digitrax makes one. This is probably uh, the most reliable and the cheapest. The other is your photo cells. And um, we'll find out in just a minute, uh, uh, both have plus and minuses. These are the photo cells that you might see just to the, to the right there is my grade crossing. And um, I do have um, the uh, 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 signal animators uh, and the photo cells for, for that. But, so both of them do have their plus and minuses. The photo cells, less wiring, but not as accurate. What I have noticed that uh, when guys come over either just to, to see the layout or maybe before an ops at that same grade crossing. If they happen to lean over, they cast shadows on there, ding, 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 the, the, the uh, grade crossings go off. Now, if you think about that, if you uh, had these photo cells to animate your signals, and you'll see in the uh, next couple of slides that uh, probably most of us have our industries, uh, our spurs to the back of the layout so that if somebody reaches over to, to uh, spot a car and cut it there, and if they happen to block that photo cell, it's going to change all the indications. And if you have somebody running a train down the main, that could throw a whole uh, wrench in the monkey works there. The rolling stock does not need a, a resistor on it. We'll come to that in a minute. And you don't have to put any gaps on your spurs or yard leads. So just the opposite with the CT coils, you're going to have to do a little bit more wiring, but they're more accurate. The rolling stock uh, does need at least one resistor on the axle. And we'll come to that uh, in just a minute. And you do have to gap one rail on your spurs and uh, your yard leads. So I know it doesn't show up real clearly, but uh, all this is is a little small surface resistor, um, you know, maybe a 32nd of an inch. And there is some conductive epoxy, that's the black goop that you see on there, that we're going to put this between uh, uh, 
on the uh, axle and on the back face of uh, the wheel. And this is so that our CT coil will have the resistance throughout the whole train, thus our whole block there. Uh, Jim Petro, my, my good friend, and a lot of you know him from when he lived here, uh, he says a couple of the guys out there put another resistor, say like on the uh, other truck. If you think about it, that uh, right now I have about 50% of the rolling stock that has these, so probably at least four or five cars in a train has one of these dispersed throughout of it, so we have good indications. Eventually, all of the freight cars and passenger cars will have this, so you figure that why would you need another another axle with this, but you know, some people just, that's the way it goes. Um, okay, so here is Albany, and I hope that, yeah, I think it shows up uh, rather well, that we want to uh, put a gap in just one rail. And so what I talked about, the, the yard lead, so here we are going into the, uh, uh, east part of the Albany yard. So we wanted to put a, a gap there. We need a gap over here for these sidings or spurs and, and the same right here for this one. If I put it right under the bridge, it probably wouldn't show up, but of course we need a gap uh, here and here on the main line so that this is our one of our signal blocks. So around the curve here, there's another set of signals. Around the curve here is another set of signals. So again, each of those signals on the one rail, and we wanna keep it the same rail that um, it gets a gap. And so what we are gonna do is put, and the reason for that is we're gonna use just one CT coil in one drop through that entire section. Now you can have, uh, let's just call it the, the south rail or the B rail. So the north rail, the A rail, you can have as many drops on that side as what you want, but we only want to have one so that we get proper uh, detection. Here's Syracuse, same, same type of deal that uh, we got to put a gap in here, one over here, one over here, one over here, one over here. Now, of course, what happens on these spurs or sidings when you cut a gap? Uh, we lose power. So we're going to have to put one feeder on that rail we just cut. All right. So hence a little bit more wiring. But if you think about it, that if you notice that any of these cars that are spotted on the spurs here for the industry, they're gonna have a resistor on it, right? So if we didn't cut that gap, that CT coil would say, ah, we got something on the main here and change the signal. So that's why the give and the take of having the more accuracy is it takes a little bit more wiring with the gap cutting and so on like that. You'll also notice that, uh, and we'll talk about this later when, it, when we actually look at the signals, is that uh, when we come westbound uh, from Albany into Syracuse, that our two mains diverge into four mains or passing sidings. Uh, Syracuse Station actually had uh, four platforms, eight tracks. Of course, we couldn't do all that on mine, so uh, this works out quite well. So here is the CT coil, and uh, here is uh, one of your feeders coming off of that, if we will, the, the, the north rail that's gonna go to our bus. And here is the, the wires that we'll see in a, a couple of slides that go to the block detector, which is gonna be our 
detection and then turn around and, and have it uh, activate. Ah, yes. Now, uh, I know from uh, giving clinics uh, uh, virtually and in this same room that uh, Bruce McCohen uh, has this Missouri rail system. Uh, this goes back to uh, about 1990 when he moved here and uh, Bruce does Santa Fe and uh, the Santa Fe, uh, even though you have one head, it has three lights, but they're green, yellow, red. Unlike the central that had could have one target and three colors could uh, emulate through that. The, the one thing that I wanna uh, point out to you now that if you really want to do any prototype signaling, it's gonna take a lot of wires. And um, uh, what we have here is uh, the Missouri rail system, which is no longer in business, but uh, Bruce just has a lot of terminal blocks. And if you can see the different colors or the different uh, lights that he's using, uh, these are relays uh, and so on, which are going to do the same thing, but we'll see later on of our Arduino. So why are an Arduino? Um, first of all, uh, I, I highly suggest that if you're going to do any prototype signaling, try to find somebody myself, Jim, uh, that has gone through this to, to give you some guidance because the learning curve is a little steep, but once you get through that, uh, it really starts to fall into place. So the little joke that Fred and I like to use a lot is I know a guy, and actually I know the three guys. Like I said, Jim Petro, uh, he does DNRGW, which is a similar uh, signal system like the Santa Fe. He has a friend, Dennis, who is a retired Union Pacific signal maintainer. Nice guy to know. Uh, Dennis uh, got himself uh, really up to speed on programming Arduinos. And uh, so he makes a little side money on doing this for a lot of clients. And I've sent him a lot of money. <laughs> So, and of course, our own Mike Berry, who uh, in the past year or so has done clinics on uh, more simplified uh, Arduino programming. So Mike also knows his way around that program. So nice bunch of guys to have. And Mike's been very, very beneficial to uh, getting me going on this. And, and, and you'll see in a little bit, the first time I got this, it's like, you're kidding me, but <clears throat> so the nice thing about uh, the Arduino that uh, even though it's a basically a mini computer or a processor, uh, you don't need this guy to run your signals like a JMRI Panel Pro or or Boost Chub system and other systems out there that rely on on a laptop to animate your signals. And it's very easy that uh, we've we've made a, a few changes, mostly because of my fault. It's like, oh, I get it now. We want this one red or this one. So um, what we've uh, done is uh, I've told Dennis that, would you please change that? He sends the, the sketch or the updated program to Mike. Mike brings his laptop over and it's very easy plug the USB uh, plug in, bada boom, bada bang, it's reprogrammed. And like I said, its sole purpose in life is just to run the signal so there's no other interference like you might get uh, with the laptop. They are this, this mega, uh, which is the biggest uh, Arduino, uh, is only about 35 bucks. And you can program it to do just about anything you want. And, and later on, uh, we'll see that uh, Dennis even asked me, he says, well, you know, uh, under this condition, this condition, uh, you would have a flashing green. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. But we could 
make it to do that. <clears throat> okay, so uh, here is the mega on the top and the uno, the smaller one, uh, on the bottom. And this is, and you know, Mike, I forgot to bring it today. Uh, Mike, Mike, uh, I went looking all around for this, no. <laughs> forgot everything else. Uh, Mike gave me uh, his that he's doing a, a program for that we'll see later on this year. But this is what the what these guys look like. And then this is what uh, it looks like when you put the, the motherboard on it or the, the pinout board. Uh, and you'll see where every one of these pins are uh, uh, holes here is going to get an input from one of the lights. And while we're here right now, we'll see that uh, if you look up that uh, they're all very nicely numbered and and uh, we'll see when we get the, the pinout sheet that where to put the certain pins to do what. Over here is the uh, the block detector. And this, this BOD has eight blocks. I have two mains, so we're gonna have, we can have four blocks on each of the mains and it works out just fine. Oh, so here begins the wire. And this is a 10 conductor, 10 wire ribbon cable. And so, you know, and it just so happens it works very, very nicely that we have eight blocks and 10 wires. So wire nine and 10 are the neutral and the hot to power the BOD. And uh, I think in some previous uh, talks that Fred has these uh, Wago locks uh, and they have been a lifesaver. Uh, I borrowed these from Fred, uh, permanently borrowed them obviously. And, uh, but they really, really work out well because you'll see, well, <laughs> they're, they're the, the next couple of slides are all covered with wires, but uh, we'll need, uh, you'll see down here, this is one of the uh, targets. So, uh, and, and it's too bad that you'll see that it's a rainbow of colors on the ribbon cable. <clears throat> and some of them, when you cut it in half, just really don't work out the, Yes, in some cases, the green is green, the yellow is yellow, but in other cases, we have to make a little chart that says, in this case, uh, like the yellow is yellow, the red is red, but uh, the orange is going to be green, and the brown is going to be our common. So on all of these signals that I have, it's the very small, like about the size of a little bigger than a, a pinhead, uh, LEDs tricolor. So we have one wire for each color and then the common ground. So uh, so every one of those targets is going to get four wires coming out of it. So it's going to get a little crowded after a while. So what Dennis does is he sits down and he starts to make a track signal diagram. And if some of you have a panel pro or have seen it maybe on Tom Gunther's, this looks very familiar. Uh, Dennis goes ahead and starts labeling uh, some things. And so like, here's a, a crossover. This, so this is gonna be crossover Albany two. Uh, here's one crossover Albany one. And here we have block one, block two, et cetera. So the whole, um, what's gonna go on this mega is um, is diagrammed out and then we get the pinout chart. And so, oops, oops. So then we get the pinout chart. And so look at this, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight blocks. Huh. So each one of those, uh, whatever we assign to that one block color, well, let's see if that was block one, then it's gonna go in whole A1, so on, so on, so on, all that. So we said that here's crossover Albany 2, so that's gonna go in whole A13. Here's crossover Albany 1, A8. So we just kind of work our way all the way down this. 
And here's the one where we talked about. So at one of those uh, targets uh, where we have three of them, and this is a good time right now to tell you that we'll see later on that the central used all three of these targets, but for my layout and for the simplicity of the operators, that center target is always gonna be red. And so we can, we can take two wires from that, the, the ground and the red wire, and send it directly to those uh, bus. We don't even have to go to the Arduino for that. We'll see later on where the, the red comes in very, very nicely for to, to work on our prototype. So you have a top and a bottom. So look at this. So we have a top, red, yellow, green, a bottom, uh, red, yellow, green, onto the other side, so on, so on, so on, so on, so on. And so then you have this spaghetti. Okay. And when I took this picture, not all of the uh, wires were hooked up. Not only do we have inputs from the signal heads, but we also have inputs from the contacts on, on the uh, tortoises, like for the crossovers. So we'll see in just a little bit, if you were coming down a certain track and if the crossover were not aligned for your track, you get all red. So we also have input in the Arduino says, okay, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this. You also see on the block detector here, we showed you on a previous slide where the, um, uh, at the uh, beginning of the CT coil where those wires went, well, here's where they end up at the, at the block detector. They do have potentiometers so that if you wanna uh, adjust the sensitivity of the resistance that it, the block detector sees, you can adjust that. And then it tells you like, if you have something in that block, uh, you get a LED that illuminates there. So that, that makes it uh, pretty easy. Okay, so going back to what I said, the central, as Steve had mentioned, uh, again, being a retired engineer, was the most complicated uh, signals out there. If you look at this end, Another uh, side note that, that Steve often says that if you want to uh, try to, to duplicate what your railroad signaling did, try to get a rule book, which this is, uh, or uh, if uh, your railroad has, a, most all of them do a historical society, go to them and if they have some archives, uh, pull out uh, their signaling. Um, uh, what we did is went to the Central Historical Society archives, found out uh, how far from the rail that the base had to, had to be. So again, as these cantilevers and so on, that something didn't clip it as it went by. So two pages of the first rule uh, 281, all those indications mean the same thing. Clear, proceed. So. Uh, Again, if we wanted to uh, activate that center target, uh, we could have done that, but this one does the same thing, green, red, red. And this one, and this one, and the semaphores uh, back then on uh, certain, especially uh, when you got into uh, the, um, the Boston uh, South Street station, they still had semaphores. So all those mean green. So, here we go. Uh, track uh, one is the one closest to us. Track two uh, is closest to the, to the backdrop. So here we have clear, proceed, green, red, red. Ah, but over here we have yellow, red, red. Well, well let's look up in the, in the rule book. So this is proceed, prepare to stop at the next signal. So when you get a yellow, Two blocks ahead, there's a train there, whether it's stopped or whether it's moving. So again, here's a side note from an engineer. Steve said, now this is back in the 50s, and you'll see that a lot of these, uh, uh, again, this over here, we can have 
red, yellow, green, uh, yellow, red, green, all sorts of different combinations. And this is how Central kind of uh, was able to uh, time their trains out or the engineers, like if they were getting too close to another one. So what Steve said, well, what a lot of these guys like to do is run the yellow. Remember that this says that two blocks ahead, there's a train there. That's why we're getting a yellow here. And maybe if we got to the next block, it'd be red, red, red. So here's, this is out of the 1951 timetable, just to show you, these are the trains departing out of Grand Central going westbound, of course, their counterparts eastbound out of Chicago, same type of deal. But uh, so uh, four o'clock, uh, no big deal. Ohio State's limited. Uh, 5.50, the Commodore Vanderbilt. Six o'clock, the flagship, the 20th century. Oh my, look at this. 6.10, the Wolverine. 6.15, the Lakeshore Limited. Then we get a little break. Seven o'clock, the Detroiter. 715, uh, the um, Southwestern Limited, and then we get another break, 750, the Cleveland Limited. So you think about it, some of these trains are only 10, 15 minutes apart going up the Hudson. So if the guy driving the um, uh, uh, Wolverine, 10 minutes behind the Century, the flagship, he knows that nothing much is gonna stop that train, right? It's gotta run on schedule. So he comes up to the yellow, he's yeah, the century, he knows the century is a couple of blocks ahead of him. I'm not gonna slow down. So he gets to the next block, sure enough, yellow. But he said, every once in a while, yeah. they got caught with their knickers down and they got to the second light there and it was red, 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 and it's like, ah! So anyways, a nice uh, side note there. So back to Syracuse, and we talked about how uh, when we're coming westbound, uh, Syracuse, the tracks diverge into four mains, and that's why we needed to, to go ahead and put a gap uh, on the other two mains so that the Arduino and the block detector will know that there's a train on that track versus this track. <clears throat> and, and then, at the other end of Syracuse, they converge back into two mains. So, so now here is the East Syracuse signals. And I don't know if you can see from either at home or on the screen behind me. So now the uh, crossover is aligned to crossover. And a lot of times uh, on, on my layout during an op session that even though we would uh, are, are running on the right notoriously, when we get to Syracuse, there could be a passenger train stop at station on the far track, there could be the Syracuse turn working the industries. So if we have a through freight, what we wanna do is uh, cross them over and run them on notoriously a eastbound track. So if we were coming up westbound on an eastbound track, we would get all red because the, the, the crossover is not aligned for us. It is for this, we get a Christmas tree and that's where we get green at the bottom. So we're clear to proceed, but we're going to be on a diverging route. Yellow up at the top, it means that we're gonna slow because at the other end, we're not sure if that switch is aligned for us to go back when it, it converges. So here we have the rule. So yellow, red, green. And again, you can see where we're perfectly okay with having that center target red all the time. So this is just gonna be it. We're gonna approach slow on, on this. Okay, so now we, most of the, um, signals on the layout are interlocking because we're having uh, uh, cross traffic and so on. But there are uh, uh, a couple of block. And, and here uh, you see again with the uh, Arduino, we can uh, program it to do, to do, do this. 
advanced approach, slow, uh, just like you see there. <clears throat> and if we were coming the other way, uh, we could have them show uh, double yellow, which again, and this is uh, advanced approach, another advanced approach, but this is prepared to stop at the second signal, kind of like our yellow, red, red on the interlocking. So again, the Arduino's figuring all this out. And again, I didn't, if you didn't notice it on the, um, and I didn't point it out, I apologize, on the uh, pinout sheet that when we have these multiple, pardon me, Arduinos, Albany's got to talk to Syracuse. So we also have a couple wires in and out of the uh, Albany Arduino over to the Syracuse Arduino, because it's got to say, hey, 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 um, if we were coming uh, from Syracuse into Albany, and if we had that train stopped at the Albany station, and then the Albany Arduino has got to tell Syracuse, hey, hey, give them a yellow light there, because two blocks ahead, there's a train there. So the, uh, the other neat thing about having these uh, nano uh, LEDs is that you can do a repeater. And I know a number of you have been to the house and seen the layout, but those of you who haven't, right over here is a wall. And then it goes back into uh, the other end of the tunnel is New York staging. So all the trains are staged to come out on the far track, track two. So I really uh, uh, only needed one set of lights here. Uh, Steve, and I know it doesn't show up real well with the trees and so on. Steve scratch built this ma ma mask, <laughs> bracket mask uh, signal here, but obviously we needed it before the crossover because that's what it's protecting. So, and being the walls right there, you could not, if you were driving a train, you could not see it. So let's make a, a little face plate out of styrene and we'll mount it to the fascia. And so when I took this picture, there was indeed uh, that Canadian Pacific train uh, stopped on track two at Albany. And so if you were driving a train out of staging, you would see this and need to stop at, at this signal. So there was a, another neat thing about uh, the, the nano LEDs. So there you go. Um, uh, we can pretty well, with all the help from Mike, Jim, Dennis, uh, and, and the modern technology, we can pretty well simulate uh, New York Central signaling uh, on the layout there. So questions, suggestions, thoughts? All right, thanks guys, appreciate it. Thank you, Russell. Thank you.